Okay, I'm gonna be real with you. I'm not gonna waste your time with a stupidly long intro. You can probably understand how these iceberg images work, and you definitely know what Mario 64 is. The only thing I want to explain before we get into it is in the bottom left I'm gonna have a little health meter corresponding to how confident I am in my explanation of whatever thing I'm talking about. Full health is I 100% know exactly what I'm talking about and I'm fully confident that it's accurate, and zero health means it's just a shot in the dark and I have no idea what I'm talking about. So let's just jump right into it. L is real 2401. This is a classic, famous rumor relating to the plaque in the castle courtyard that has the star above it. Some people think that this plaque says L is real 2401, hinting at maybe Luigi being in the game or the release date of Paper Mario in North America. In reality, this plaque doesn't really say anything. The texture is only 32 by 32 pixels, so even extracting it from the game, you can't really make out what it says. If I had to guess, I would say it says Eternal Star, but again, it probably just says nothing. The Space World 95 Beta Space World was sort of a public exhibition sort of thing where Nintendo would show off upcoming video games, and of course, Mario 64 was shown at Space World 1995, one year before it was eventually released. This is one of the most famous video game betas out there, with tons of footage of it existing around the internet, and that's probably why it's on the top level of this iceberg. Womp's Fortress Tower 1-Up In Womp's Fortress, if you punch the back of the tower that appears after you've defeated King Womp, there will be a 1-Up. Most players wouldn't probably think to punch it on their first playthrough, but in terms of obscure secrets, it's paradoxically pretty well known. Bobum Battlefield Bridge Hanging On the underside of this bridge in Bobum Battlefield, you can hang to it like any of the other climbable ceilings in this game. There's pretty much no reason to actually do this, which is why it's kind of obscure. Half A Presses and Parallel Universes Now, I could make a stupid, tired joke at the expense of Pan and Koek or TJ Henry Yoshi, but god knows both of them are sick of this by now. So, I'm just gonna basically summarize some of the stuff that's in the video, but honestly, Penin does such a better job at explaining it than I ever could. Basically, a parallel universe is a copy of the geometry of any Super Mario 64 level that exists way out in the distance relative to the regular level. Normally, in a casual playthrough, you would never ever be able to access these, and these are only useful in terms of things like the zero A presses runs. Half A presses are basically just a notation used in isolation. So what Pennon describes in his video is that in Watch for Rolling Rocks, he does the entirety of that star with the A button held down. So he notes it as 0.5 A presses, but he says in a full game run, that it would just be counted as one A press. People in the comments section seem to not understand this to this day, saying that no, you can't, the button is not analog, you can't have half an A press. Whereas he specifically says it only exists in isolation of that specific star and tool assisted speedrun. Impossible coin slash Goomba. This is another pen and coic topic. Super Mario 64 has a few coins that are not collectible. One of them exists in Tiny Huge Island because one of the coins spawns underneath part of the level, and in the final Bowser level, there is a triad of Goombas, and one of them spawns where there is no ground, so he appears at the death barrier, and his coin cannot be collected. Again, just watch the video Pan and Koek put out on this that he did a couple years ago. Big Boo Unused Text There's a piece of text within the game that goes unused that says He he he, you're mine now, he he. I'll pass right through this wall. Can you do that? He he he. You can make NPCs say this extremely easily, but it's unknown as to why it went unused. Maybe the Boo in the castle would have said this. When it comes to things like this, there's not much we can do but speculate. Don't become his lunch. 
In Hazy Maze Cave, there's a sign that says a gentle sea dragon lives here. Pound on his back to make him lower his head. Don't become his lunch. The first two sentences make sense, but the last sentence seems to contradict the first one. Dory can't even harm you in this game. Honestly, it was probably just the translators having some fun, since Dory might look a bit scary to a small child playing this game. Mirror Room The mirror room in the upstairs floor of the castle is where Snowman's Land is accessed, but many players naturally want to go through or behind the mirror. There actually is collision back there, but no way to access it other than maybe backwards long jumping. In the DS remake, you actually have to enter the mirror to find Wario as well as a secret star. Dancing Flowers Mario 64 has a few weather effects, such as snow, as well as lava bubbles in Lethal Lava Land and Bowser in the Fire Sea. The lava bubbles basically stick to the floor, or in this case the lava, and play their bubbling animation. There exists a similar effect in which flowers will stick to the floor and play a dancing animation. Volcano Blocks A bunch of cubes are just thrown about near the star platform inside the Lethal Lava Land volcano. They're probably just there for decoration, but, you know, they're on this image anyway, might as well explain them. Secret Aquarium. I don't know why this one is on here. You literally need to go there to get all 120 stars. You can backwards long jump into these fish tanks, but there isn't anything there. Ghoul Metal. In Big Boo's Haunt, there's a signpost that says, You don't stand a ghost of a chance in this house. If you walk out of here, you deserve a ghoul medal. This is literally just a pun on the word gold metal. Yellow cap switch. The three cap switches in the game, the red, the green, and the blue one, are all actually the same object, but each color switch just has a different parameter set. There does exist a fourth yellow switch in the game, much like the ones from Super Mario World, and would have unlocked Koopa shells. Broken paintings. There are several paintings in the upper floor of the castle that don't act as level warps, some of which are direct copies of existing paintings on other floors. If you ask me though, it's just Nintendo being resourceful with their textures, and chose to give the upstairs walls some more flair. HMC Alcove. There are a few little ledges in the toxic maze that don't lead out of the maze, presumably they exist as a means of letting players breathe for a bit, and without their health draining as they navigate the maze. E.T. in the Pyramid The hieroglyphs in the Shifting Sandland Pyramid have the letters E.T. on the right side. Ignoring the conspiracy of aliens built the pyramids, this was either just a random bit of humor snuck in, or the letters were placed there at random by the Japanese texture artists without any thought of their significance. Jolly Roger Bay Vanishing Fog This one is interesting. When you first enter Jolly Roger Bay, there's a subtle fog that rests above the water, and the skybox has a sort of yellow-green hue to it. After collecting the first star, it goes away forever, and doesn't come back even if you select star 1 again. You have to start a new file just to see it again. It's honestly very overlooked, and not as pronounced as the other details in levels such as the Womp's Fortress Pyramid appearing, or the Big Dud. After defeating King bob one of the pink bob will say, Thank you, Mario. The big bob is nothing but a big dud now. Additionally, the pit that previously only had two steel balls rolling around it has three in it, and it'll only go back down to having two if you select the first star and fight King bob again. Yoshi Saddle In every official picture of Yoshi, the saddle or shell on his back has a white outline. In Super Mario 64, it is entirely red. Even stranger is that the rim of the saddle is actually mottled, but colored red instead of white. Yoshi's polygons are colored by the game itself, and the only textures he uses are for his eyes. Bugged Fire Texture When Mario is burned, the smoke textures that spawn behind him are meant to look different than the ones shown in-game. It's extremely subtle, and unless it's been pointed out to you, you'd assume that's how it was intended to look. Unagi's Tunnel In Jolly Roger Bay, Unagi the eel has a small hole that he emerges from. There's actually a tunnel behind it that is fully modeled, but Mario has no way of accessing it, and it's unlikely that a normal player would even see it. Blarg Blargs are enemies that appeared in Super Mario World, and a couple other Mario games before Super Mario 64 would be released. An untextured model of a Blarg exists in Super Mario 64, along with a few animations, and it can be reinserted into Lethal Lava Land with a simple code. Shh, please walk quietly in the hallway is a rather obscure sign that exists on the upper floor of the castle. No idea what this one means. 
Mips throwing. The rabbit that appears in the castle can't be thrown normally, but he can be thrown underwater. This is only possible if you clip through a door and bring Mips into the room with the two pillars. A 1996 developer interview also showed that Mario was able to throw Mips by the ears earlier on in development. JRB Box This box on the Jolly Roger Bay ship has some weird collision on it and it can do weird amounts of damage to you if you just kind of look at it wrong. It's really just such a strange object because most players would just walk right past it without even thinking, and it doesn't really pose much of a challenge even for new players. Womp King turns into the castle. King Womp complains that womps are used to build things, and after he dies, a castle is built where he once was. If you want to be more morbid, maybe they use his body to lay the foundational brickwork. Wet Dry World Skybox Wet Dry World is a unique level in a couple of ways, and it's one of the few where the skybox is not shared with any other level in the game. According to a tweet from Supper Mario Broth, it's an edited photo of Casares in Spain. This also relates to the skyboxes are photographs point on the iceberg. Debug Menu Names by inputting a specific cheat code, you can access a hidden level select in Mario 64. This level select contains a beta version of the title screen, as well as a bunch of different names for all of the levels in the game. Mainly these are just shortened versions and or different names of all the existing levels. Anyone who's coded anything will tell you that using shorthands for names of things is extremely common. True Locations of the Painting Worlds like with most video games, we rarely stop to think such benign questions as, I wonder where this specific level is in the Mario universe. However, Womp's Fortress returning in Mario Galaxy 2 implies that the paintings are sending Mario to real locations instead of him just literally entering a world that only exists within that painting. For example, if the painting in Womp's Fortress was destroyed, Womp's Fortress would still exist independent of it, and the same could be said for any of the other painting worlds. Tiny Huge Island also seems to be similar to the Giant Land from Super Mario Bros. 3, specifically the one level where you can change between the big and the small version, and Tall Tall Mountain may harken back to the athletic levels from the first Super Mario Bros. I guess I should also just go over Tower of the Wing Cap true location here as well, since that's also on the same level of the iceberg. Tower of the Wing Cap has buildings nearby which implies that they are connected to a piece of land far below, but of course we don't know anything about the land down there. Haunted Dirt Texture Some people claim to see a face in this dirt texture in bob on Battlefield, but I don't see anything. Maybe the iceberg image is referring to a completely different dirt texture, but honestly, if you guys see anything, please let me know, because I straight up don't notice anything in this. Lethal Lava Land Painting Fireball While there's no shortage of fire in Lethal Lava Land, none of the fireballs in the game have faces. It does closely resemble the fireballs that rain down on Mario in the final battle in Super Mario World. Island in the Distance In the bob on Battlefield skybox, there are a few islands way out there, obviously inaccessible since they're just part of the sky texture. Mario enters Wet Dry World early in the Got Milk commercial. I don't think that this is true, because in the Got Milk commercial Mario has 37 stars, and while Wet Dry World is in the upper floor of the castle, getting to the second Bowser level only requires 30 stars to open the door, as well as the one star that's required you collect in Dire Dire Docks. So it's entirely possible that you can get upstairs with only 31 stars, let alone 37. Zelda 64 Beta Assets in Wet Dry World Ocarina of Time, known as Zelda 64 earlier on, was in development around the same time as Super Mario 64, and the two series just generally have a lot of shared history, as being two of Nintendo's biggest. A few screenshots of the Zelda 64 Beta kind of resemble Mario 64, specifically Wet Dry World, and these doors are almost the exact same. There's also the famous Space World 95 video of Zelda 64, where a very different looking Link is fighting a copy of himself with none other than Metal Mario's texture. bob -omb Village I think the iceberg image is referring to this image, which depicts a bunch of bob -omb's in an empty field next to some unknown figure. In the Nintendo 64 development kit, there apparently existed a man with a sombrero, so this could just be him. 
Come to think of it, it is kind of weird how Mario is the only human to set foot in any of the levels. Secret Slide Dimensional Rift. I guess this might be referring to the fact that the slide in the castle is way, way too big to actually fit inside of the castle. I don't know, it's a video game, it doesn't have to really make that much sense. Like, Mario goes into paintings and stuff and no one questions it. Womp's Fortress Interior. Fortresses are usually built in order to protect things, but you can't go inside of Womp's Fortress. The Japanese name is essentially the same, but it could be read as Womp King's Fortress or Castle. But like, they probably just named it that after they built the level. In Galaxy 2, you actually can enter the center in order to fight King Womp. Side note, but if you want a ROM hack that lets you play a reimagined version of Womp's Fortress and that lets you go inside of the fortress, play Womp's Castle by Phileg. The End Screen I've heard a few people say that the perspective on the end cake screen looks kind of weird, and I can't deny that in the background, if you look closely, there's some weird thing that kind of looks like a weird Yoshi. Rainbow Rides Village Super Smash Bros. Melee has a recreation of Rainbow Ride from Mario 64, and in the background, there's a tiny little town on a mountainside, which is not present in Mario 64. Yoshi commits suicide. After collecting 120 stars and getting up on top of the castle, you can talk to Yoshi. He will give you 99 lives and jump into the horizon, which some people interpreted as him committing suicide. Removed Courses A total of 32 levels were planned for the game, but there are only 15 main courses, as well as 8 other levels, making that 23 levels in total. Big Boo's Secret Laugh In Big Boo's Haunt, you can sometimes hear a lower-pitched version, of the boo laugh used in the game. <laughs> 120 has spiritual significance. Apparently, the number 120 is something called an angel number, and whenever it shows up in your life it serves as a message from angels that it's time to take initiative in a creative undertaking or something. Okay, I'm gonna be honest with you, I have no fucking idea what this means. You can assign meaning to any numbers that you want. 120 is not unique in this regard. So, I mean, sure, I guess 120 has spiritual significance, but spoiler alert, I don't really believe in this. Cold Cold Crevice. There's a sign in Cool Cool Mountain that refers to a place called Cold Cold Crevice down below. This doesn't really mean anything, and it's just a nice little bit of alliteration. Moving on. Mario 64 is Freemason Initiation. The game begins in a Masonic Hall, where there is a checkerboard floor, symbolic of the world of polarized opposites, the physical world on which the ritual is based. There's also a solar disk, red carpet, and the hall is three layers. The Coins in the game are actually pentacles, and they are the coins from tarot and occult symbolism. In this game, you play the role of a Mercury-type character traveling to the Earth in between the realms. The thread goes on to basically describe a bunch of shit that is, you can kind of link it to Freemasonry, but I mean, it's like, come on. Come on, it, like, come on, dude. How Bowser got into the castle with his sub. In Dire Dire Docks, there's this hole that leads to the outside of the castle, which some people have theorized is how Bowser got his submarine in there. Big Boo's Haunt Forest When Mario enters Big Boo's Haunt, he's actually entering into that little cage that comes out of the Big Boo in the courtyard. So why does it change from a regular sunny day to a nighttime forest? Well, my theory for this is that since he's shrunk down to the size of the cage, the blades of grass around him and sticks and stuff look like a forest to him. That doesn't really explain why it's suddenly nighttime, but hey, no theory's perfect. Original Resolution Textures Mario 64 textures are, at their biggest, only 32 by 64 pixels wide, which is tiny in comparison to the textures that are used in video games and stuff today. Now it is entirely possible that Nintendo may have created their own textures from scratch, but they could have also used textures that used to be much higher resolution, before crunching them down to fit on the N64 cartridge. But it seems that we might never actually know what these original textures looked like. Ally 
comply with info. A toad on the upper floor of the castle says, Here, let me tell you a little something about the castle. In the room with the mirrors, look carefully for anything that's not reflected in the mirror. But in the DS version, they changed the end of that line to say, Look carefully for anything that's not reflected in the mirror. And an ally with info. I think this is a vague hint that you need to use the power flower in order to pass through the mirror. And I guess in the Mario universe, it wouldn't be too unreasonable that a toad would consider a flower to be an ally of his. I would have said that the toad is referring to Wario, since you need to enter the mirror to access the level where he's imprisoned, but the toad will still repeat the ally with info line if you're playing as Wario. The toads have unique dialogue that depends on which character you're using, so it's not like they just copied over the dialogue they used for Mario. It was an intentional thing that they left in. Metal Mario Texture Initially, I wasn't sure what the Metal Mario Texture could be, but eCumber on Twitter made an amazing discovery about the origin of this texture, so please give them a follow, because this part of the video wouldn't exist without them. Basically, eCumber was looking through a dump from a Silicon Graphics Indie, which was a workstation that was used at the time, and they found this image. If you flip the image upside down and squish it down to be 64 by 32 pixels, it's almost an exact match for the Metal Mario texture used in game. Wet Dry World Negative Emotional Aura. Okay, this one is one that I feel very strongly about. Because for some reason, whenever I play Mario 64, I just kind of want to stop when I when I hit Wet Dry World. You know, it's it's just such a weird feeling level. It feels almost claustrophobic, I guess. So Wet Dry World is composed of two different parts. The main part where you are raising and lowering the water level and there's like secrets and stuff and there are all these little enemies running around that like flip you around and stuff. And there is the little town part. Now as a kid, I don't think I ever actually got to access the town without like looking it up. And even today it's like kind of weird and cumbersome to get to because you have to raise the water level, lower the water level, blah blah blah. And once you're in that town, you can't really get out, and it's all, like, boxed in. So the level feels, again, claustrophobic. And I, there's just, I don't know, it just feels, again, it feels like there's a negative emotional aura there that I can't really explain. I guess maybe the music, combined with the very dull visuals, combined with the weird skybox and the feeling of being boxed in I don't it just feels so weird and it like I'm glad I'm very glad that at least one other person in the world feels this way about wet dry world because it's it's a weird level peach is behind the stained glass window the stained glass painting at the front of the castle is certainly iconic but once you go inside, you'll notice that the texture that they use for the interior version is actually slightly different. So, there's the belief that this isn't actually a window with just two sides. There is a little tiny area inside there. And at the very end of the game, when Peach finally spawns in front of the castle, there's the belief that she was actually behind the stained glass the whole time. It makes sense in the context of Mario 64, the whole game you're entering paintings and stained glass is, while it's not a painting, it's a piece of art, so Peach being trapped inside there thematically would make sense. Toads literally trapped inside the walls. A few toads in the game verbatim say the lines, we're trapped inside the castle walls, or the princess is trapped somewhere in the walls, and even Bowser in the final fight says that your friends are trapped in the walls. Again, this might just be a figurative thing, but what's more interesting to me is, I'm sure most of you know this, that the first Super Mario Bros. game, Bowser turns toads into bricks and, you know, Mario smashes the bricks, people think that, oh, he's murdering them, but no, he's just freeing them from the bricks or something. The point is, I would like to believe that if you were to take this line literally, Bowser has again turned the toads into bricks and they are literally part of the walls now. Hazy Maze Cave is the castle's septic system. This is kind of just a meme. The Hazy Maze Cave room, you could interpret it as a fucking toilet. 
because the walls have like pipes there. It's kind of gross, I guess. There's this image, which I hate looking at it, but I'm gonna make you look at it too. So there you go. Bowser broke the door. The door that leads out of the castle courtyard has a layer of bricks around it, which could imply that they had to be placed there after the door had been broken through, as they mismatch the colors of the rest of the wall. The possible hole that these bricks are filling is suspiciously Bowser-sized. Forbidden door. Possibly just the one in the mirror room again. I think I've talked about that door like three times so far. Wiggler's body parts are used in the Bowser fights. The yellow spheres that border the Bowser arenas look very similar to the ones that make up Wiggler's body. However, if you replace the texture that Wiggler uses for his body, the spheres around the Bowser arena won't change, and vice versa, meaning that they're not actually using Wiggler's body parts. Full Omen Archives Okay, it's time for a bit of a history lesson here, so bear with me. In 1993, Silicon Graphics signed a deal with Nintendo to produce the GPU used in the Nintendo 64. Silicon Graphics also developed MIPS, standing for Microprocessor Without Interlocked Pipeline Stages, which is where MIPS the Rabbit in Mario 64 gets his name from. The Omen Archive was a leak of Nintendo technical documents, which was perpetrated by a Silicon Graphics employee. The archive was a .rar file that was uploaded to the internet in 1999, titled omen.rar. Even the reason it's called Omen is unknown, but in short, this is the reason early Nintendo 64 emulation was able to exist. However, since these resources were obtained illegally, any emulator developer looking to use the Omen resources is liable to be sued due to using these illegally obtained materials. I'm no expert on the subject, so I implore you to do your own research on this topic, but that's basically a short history of the Omen archives. The June 29th, 1995 build. This was apparently a beta build of the game, which had a glitch where textures would rapidly flash, possibly causing seizures. There is very little information on this build of the game, if it exists at all. The first time the public laid eyes on Mario 64 was in November of 1995, months after the supposed June 29th build. Ironically, the circulation of this iceberg image has filled all the search results of this build with more fan-made stuff than any actual evidence of this build's existence, so for the time being I'm gonna say that this build isn't real. I should mention that from this point forward a lot of the content on this iceberg is mostly made up for the sake of being creepy or mysterious. Now I'm all in favor of shitposting for the sake of perpetuating creepy myths, but the purpose of this video is to be educational about Mario 64, so I'll mostly be skipping over the bullshit ones. Mario 64 is definitely personalized though, that one is 100% true. The Wario Apparition. Okay, I love the Wario Apparition as much as the next guy, but this was not an actual thing that happened in Mario 64. This image on the side of the iceberg only exists because of a 1996 Nintendo E3 conference in which Wario's face is superimposed on top of Mario 64 where he insults the game in true Wario fashion. Ah, oh, this is terrible! Hui! Who would buy stuff like this anyway? Oh, what? You think this is fun? You gotta be cuckoo crazy! You want fun? Wario show you fun! However, because of this line, the Wario apparition, there have been a bunch of fan creations around the internet with like weird, creepy Wario and Mario 64 things. It's really great. I'll link a few in the description or something. Toad projection. I couldn't find any information for this one, but my best guess would be that sometimes in the castle you can get the camera to misbehave, and you can see objects standing in an empty black void. I know for a fact that this works with the star doors, and I couldn't get it to work with Toad, but they're also objects, so in theory they should work. The Bowser Room. This is an edited image by Chris O'Neill of Oni Plays. I don't really watch Oni Plays, but there's some episode where they just talk about making this image back in the day. Nothing about it is real, so let's just move on. Brain Diagram. Allegedly there's some brain diagram hidden in the assets of Wet Dry World or possibly some other stage, but I could find no tangible evidence of this, and honestly I've looked through all the textures of Mario 64 more times than I'm willing to admit, and there is no brain diagram that I know of. 
course in the Bowser painting. There are several paintings of Bowser and Peach throughout the castle, and there are some of the few paintings that you can't enter. Of course, Bowser has three different levels to his name, but I guess that brings up the question. Which level would you enter if you could hop into the Bowser painting? In the original, the background used is completely black, but in the DS version, it has sort of a greenish-gray background, which matches up most closely with the Bowser in the Dark World background. I guess it's fitting, since you first see the Bowser painting right before you're thrown into the Dark World. Delicious Cake A string of text in the Japanese version just says Delicious Cake and it's located in between the names for the Secret Aquarium and the Castle Secret Stars. The only guess I could make is that the developers intended for there to be actual lines of text on the end cake screen, put Delicious Cake there as a placeholder, decided not to enable the text, and just left the Delicious Cake string unedited, which honestly wouldn't be too out of the question. Internal Plexus of the Castle The exterior of Peach's castle is actually way too small to contain the maps they were able to explore inside. This is standard video game stuff, and this video by Skellix illustrates this pretty well. I think this also relates to the secret slide dimensional rift thing that I mentioned earlier in the video. NFR cartridge differences. NFR cartridges, meaning not for resale, were copies that were sent out to stores so that customers could view or even play demos of them in the store. Some NFR carts were specifically made so that you'd be locked out of certain areas, or they may have even contained content that didn't make it into the final game. However, the NFR cartridge for Mario 64 has no differences than the one that was actually released, aside from the not for resale label on the cartridge. Miyamoto stole Mario 64 from Argonaut. Argonaut Games was a British development studio that worked with Nintendo in the SNES era, and their most famous game was probably Star Fox. In an interview with Eurogamer, Jez San, the founder of Argonaut, revealed that they had pitched a Yoshi game to Nintendo, which would have apparently been the world's first 3D platformer. Nintendo didn't want to take such a big risk with an outside company using their pre-existing characters, and the 3D Yoshi game never ended up being made. However, it did get repurposed to become Croc, which was released on the PS1 and Sega Saturn. San then went on to say in the same interview, quote, Miyamoto went on to make Mario 64, which had the look and feel of our Yoshi game, but with a Mario character, of course, and beat Croc to the market by around a year. Miyamoto came up to me at a show afterwards, and apologized for not doing the Yoshi game with us, and thanked us for the idea to do a 3D platform game. The thing is though, I don't believe that Miyamoto completely stole the idea for a 3D platformer. Video games had been moving towards 3D at a gradual pace, and it seemed like the natural progression of how video games would evolve over time, and it makes complete sense that Nintendo would release a Mario game to help launch their new console. Jez San went on in the interview about some other stuff Nintendo did, and I won't deny that Nintendo definitely fucked Argonaut over in the end, but again, I wouldn't claim that Mario 64 was outright stolen from them. Shared Nightmares I'll leave you with a more thought-provoking one for last. Super Mario 64 was many people's first experience with a fully 3D game, and of course many people played it when they were kids. That also means it would naturally pop up into people's dreams over time as well. There are a select few moments in this game that stand out to many people as being creepy, intentional or not. The mad piano, the giant eel, the infinite staircase, I've even heard a couple people were afraid of the chain chomp when they were younger. In a game as open-ended and expansive as Mario 64, for the time, it's no wonder that a lot of people would end up having similar dreams about it. Here's another thing that isn't really related to dreams, but I found interesting anyway. In your mind, I want you to picture Mario running around in Super Mario 64. Now, did you imagine Mario falling into a pit? Allegedly, it's hard for people to separate the two things, almost as if Mario can't exist in your mind without having him fall into a pit. The reasons for this are seemingly obvious. Many of us probably have a fair share of memories from falling off courses like Rainbow Ride, and Mario's scream when he's falling is probably burned into your brain right now. Still, it's a fun little thought experiment to try out. So, you've made it to the end of the video. I know it was a long one, but I hope you learned something new. You did stick around until the end, so it clearly interested you. I could go on with the repetitive YouTuber outros like this video was really hard to make or please like and subscribe, but this video's gone on long enough. I do genuinely appreciate any support you'd be willing to give on this video, and honestly I had a lot of fun making it. But for now, goodbye.